We have uh, 30 minutes for a talk and then five minutes for questions. Okay. okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to give this talk. So this, is, this will be a talk about some recent work that we've done associated with the uh, binary pair black hole. So this is based on the work uh, of uh, Raphael and Camilla, which is our uh, postdoc. And Ming Zizong and Michael Campbell, who is, um, sorry, who is uh, a student. And this will also be based on our dear work. I see. Okay. Good. So, um, so let me begin. So, actually, there's been a long uh, history of development on how to extract uh, classical quantities from uh, the quantum, from quantum field theory computation. So, even in the early 70s, for example, Michael Duff, he were able to reconstruct the short shot matrix. Okay, so the short shot matrix um, from a perturbative climate diagram. And later on, people were for Kerr Newman, for example, with the black hole is, is charged, you can just extract the, 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 the form of the metric by computing the quantum correction. So supposedly this is a quantum diagram, but there's actually a classical piece of it there. And in here you can just use this to extract the, the charged black hole surface in perturbative. Uh, more recently, uh, for the, a more recent example would be to compute, for example, the gravitational uh, two part of the, the two body of uh, the classical part, uh, sorry, the gravitational potential of a, of a two body system by, for example, computing the two to two scattering, where by the two, from the two to two scattering, uh, you get the S matrix and from the S matrix, you can get the potential, but you need to identify this as a potential in terms of momentum. Uh, the center of mass momentum and the exchange momentum, and you do the Fourier transform. And for example, then you get uh, the relativistic correction to the body correction. Okay. So there's really a, has been a long history in, 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 do, in doing such computations. Now, if you look at this computation, um, so you see that what's really happening is you're actually uh, you're actually uh, approximately you're, you're describing the, the source of your gravity gravitational object at the point particle. So you, you're, you're really drawing a point particle line and then maybe grab it. So basically we're trying to, in, in these kind of computation where it's essentially uh, treating these classical entities as quantum particles. Now you might think that why why are we able to do this? Or why is this even why does this even make sense? Well if you think about it, it actually makes perfect sense because of the no hair theorem, right? We usually from the no hair theorem we state that black holes are characterized by mass, charge, and spin. And mass, charge, and spin is exactly the, the quantum numbers you use, you use to describe particles. So it's not surprising that you can use particles to, to, to describe particles. And so the question that one naturally asks is how does the how does elementary particles capture the dynamics of black holes? If you think about it, then not just from this computation alone, since this computation was really geared towards computing the two-body uh, potential. Which is actually used to compute the waveform uh, for a, a black hole merger during the in spiral phase. Okay, so it actually makes perfect sense because in, when you're in the in spiral phase, black holes are far apart, and so you can treat them as point particles, and therefore you can compute their dynamics uh, through this kind of quantum field. But if you think about it, then you might ask, wait a minute, but isn't everything a point particle when you're far away? Right, so what so what does this kind of description, how does this distinguish between black holes and things that are not black holes? Well, if you really want to talk about something that is a point particle, then what you really want to do is you want to do a worldwide description, which we learn in quantum mechanics. And in a worldwide description, so but in any quantum mechanics course, you usually just start with the leading term, which is a kinetic, uh, just a kinetic term. However, because now we're talking about something in a non-trivial background, that means that on the world line, you can now introduce an infinite number of, you can call higher dimension operators, which describe how this world line degrees of freedom couple with the background. So for example, a leading order, if, 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 the, if the particle that you have is just a single particle, then uh, a leading order, you can have these two operators. So E and E are just the Riemann tensor. Uh, B is the, well, the Riemann tensor compared to the Lavish of Vida. Uh, so we call it the electrically implemented part of the Riemann tensor. And now you can have two operators here, 
where, where the, the operator is clearly a uh, Wilson coefficient. And now the Wilson coefficient characterizes what that object on the world line is. So, for example, these are the famous tidal num love numbers which describe how the object stretches on an external gravitational field. And for black holes and four dimensions, these are zero. But for neutron stars, these are not zero. Okay. So, in other words, even though we have a, we were treating things as a particle, you can still differentiate between black holes and neutron stars without ever talking about the existence of horizons or, 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 or things that are close to uh, the state sign structure of black holes. Now, if we turn on spin, which means that we're not des describing something that is spinning, that means your world line uh, action now needs to include spin degrees of freedom. Now you can have even at linear order, you have an infinite number, number of operators you can have. Even at linear order, linear order because this is linear and DMP. Okay. And this essentially describes the infinite possible number of multiple moments associated with the spinning object. So again, you have an infinite number of Wilson uh, coefficients which describe this object. And here, the, the complete all order computation was done uh, relatively recently from a GR point of view. And, and, and this normalization, Sorry, in this normalization, uh, black holes uh, have Wilson coefficients one in this normalization. So that distinguishes uh, what is a black hole. Great. So this will be our setup. And now we want to ask the following question. So what characterizes, what is special about this spin multiple of black holes? I mean, what is special about this value one? Uh, and we want to answer this question by looking at this from a particle. Now, this might appear challenging because we know that when we're talking about particles, we now need to talk about particles as spin, but we don't have any notion of what is an elementary particle beyond spin two. Not just so, but because we want to talk about black hole uh, uh, spin multiples, we need infinite, we need arbitrary high spin. So, how do we think about this problem? The second question we will like is what are the underlying physical principles that, uh, that select these moments? In other words, what is special about spin? If we can have an answer to that, then maybe we have some, some new understanding about uh, uh, an on shell version of what the known here theory would say. So, to answer this question, we're going to today we're going to look at a very simple um, uh, object, which is just a three point amplitude uh, involving two uh, spin and, uh, and emitting a gravity. So, this is very elementary since it's just a three point particle, so we should be able to do this very simply. And we can just characterize all the possible interactions in a completely onshore way without introducing any notion of fields. And to do this, we are just going to use group theory. And basically, we just, since we're in four dimensions, so this is something that we developed. Uh, this is a new formalism or uh, a covariant formalism that uh, we've developed with Nima and the previous two students, then, which is valid for four dimensions, which covariant tries the, the, the little groups. Basically, we know that for a massive particle, the transform has irreducible representation of SP2. And so that means any, any irreducible representation of SP2 uh, should be a symmetric tensor of SP2. Now, for massive particle, of course, uh, the, the little group is E1. So basically, the, what I want to say is that this three point amplitude that we're interested in here is just a function that carries a little group weight. And then must be a tensor of 2s times 2s and sp2 represent. So once we identify this, all we need to do is just to find something that parameterizes this function. And to do that, uh, we use uh, the, the spinner helicity formalism, which you, instead of using four vectors, we're going to use the two by two matrix to represent the momentum. And depending on whether it's massive or massive, uh, the, this two by two factorizes either into two spinner or for massive, it factorizes into a product. Uh, a, a sum of two uh, spinners with this i, which is precisely this uh, massive little SP2. So this is very simple. So that means that when you're talking about three point interactions of arbitrary spin, you're asking about what are the possible tensor structures uh, associated with. Uh, so, so there's essentially 2s plus one possible tensor structure. And to parameterize this tensor structure, you, you can just use the, the, the variables that are, that are available to you. So for us, since this is a two-dimensional space, so the natural vector to span this two-dimensional space is the, is the spinner associated with the mass of the line here. And so we're going to use that spinner and the, the, that vector, uh, which is this uh, lambda three here, as well as the, the one that is orthogonal to it, so it has an epsilon 
And then we're going to have an, another object which carries a little bit of weight of the masses and the, of the masses. And that comes from, you can, you can define the kinematics, uh, the three point kinematics. And you can show that the lambda three will be proportional to lambda three filled up. And this proportionality is defined as x. So this x is defined to this equation. So the only point, the only important point about this slide is just that the fundamental variables that you want to use to parameterize the function are these variables. It gets on x, which carries the residue weight, and the lambda three, uh, the lambda three, and the epsilon. Then these are all just defined to the number. Once you do this, then it's just trivial. For spin one half, you have these, for example, for spin one half, uh, coupling to, uh, so for spin one half coupling to photon, you just have two structures. For spin one, you have three structures that are possible. In general, for spin has you have um, two S plus one structure. Now notice that because I'm defining these things completely in a kinematic way. So that means these are the physical way of defining how things couple. So for example, this uh, for spin one half coupled to photon, this G is precisely G minus two. And for those of you who, uh, who uh, went to a quantum field theory class, you know that you get the G minus three, you can do a lot of uh, algebra, the Clipper algebra here, it just, just comes out immediately. For spin one, uh, these are the G minus two for spin one, and then the quadruple here. So this, everything just splits, splits apart uh, cleanly. Okay, good. So once you look at this, uh, you might then the, the natural first thing you want to ask is okay, what happens when all of these g's are zero and then just left with the leading ones. What would be what would that happen? Of course, for spin one half, you know what that is. That is just QED. And you can hear this could be a very example. This is the one of the very textbook you have with the QED three point coupling. And then you just plug in the kinematics and then do some algebra, and then you see that this thing just collapses into the final thing, which is just proportional to S. So that's just the leading ones. For spin one, that's a WW gamma coupling. You just have the leading. So then the natural question is, so what about arbitrary spin? So now we have this kinematically defined arbitrary spin coupling. And we can define then and we can just put S to be any value here. We already know that for S equal to one half and one, these are standard model couplings. But what happens when S equals two? Sorry, when what happens when S equals two, S equals three, when S equals 150? We have the amplitude, but we don't know what these corresponds to. So what are these objects that are sitting here? Uh, to answer that, we can go back to this moral line action and we can match our coupling to the, the Wilson coefficients of this moral line action. Okay, and this is just a direct map. And after mapping, you'll find that the relation between our minimal coupling for arbitrary spin and the Wilson coefficient takes this form. So you'll notice that if I take S to infinity, and h bar is zero. If I take this limit, which we call it, which is called the classical spin limit, meaning that s you're taking s to infinity h bar is zero and s to h bar fixed, uh, that gives you the classical spin. Then you'll find that c just goes to one. This minimal coupling just goes to one. So for this, so this thing that we write down that we don't have a quantum field theory really of the level that you can have, for example, if you take s to 100, we'll know what that is going to the elementary part of the quantum field theory. But in the classical limit, this interaction gives you precisely the black hole of the whole. Okay. So in other words, minimal coupling is just black hole. It's just a spinning black hole. And if you don't, if you don't, if you kind of still have some doubt, then we can just do a direct computation. So we can compute the gravitational potential between two minimal coupled objects with a single graviton extent. So this will correspond to the first postman's Kalski correction to the Newtonian. And the computation is straightforward. And after you do the if you do the Fourier transform, this is the gravitational potential that you get. And you can directly match it, it exactly matches with the GR the first postman Kalski order or curved black hole. This is exactly the same gravitational potential that you would get. So uh, identifying uh, this minimal coupling actually teach us a lot uh, and teach us a lot about things that we've known before. So for example, by the fact that the minimal coupling, that the minimal coupling gets uh, black holes. Um, okay. So you see that by taking the, the, the classical spin limit, what actually happens to the three point coupling is that it induces uh, an exponentiation factor. There's an exponentiation phenomenon 
that is proportional to the spin. So what that means is that if you if you compute any physical observable associated with a spinning black hole, what happens is because for example here this is a, 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 a sample computation where you can compute the impulse. Uh, this is, if you can understand this very uh, very intuitively because this is just the scattering amplitude or the PPP scattering amplitude weighted by Q mu, which is the transfer of moment, and then you integrate over all the transfer possible transfer moments. So naturally, this gives you the, 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 the amount of impulse that you should get. Anyway, so this is the, the way you will compute an impulse. So the difference between a spinning and a non spinning object will be this exponential factor. Which when you put it in here, you see that it just shifted this Fourier transform. So in other words, this B, which is an impact parameter, when the thing is spinning, it just shifts the impact parameter by a complex shift. And this exactly explained what was observed in 1960 when people were studying black hole solutions. They realized that new once Kerr wrote down the rotating solution, Newman and Janus noticed that if you write things in the first child form. Uh, the short shot solution, the non spinning solution related to the curve solution, is just a complex shift. So they okay, just defer by the scalar function and just take the scalar function into a complex shift. You can relate the, the short shot solution to the curve solution. This is a non perturbative non relation between two classical solutions of a nonlinear Einstein equation. This is quite remarkable. Uh, what is the reason behind this, this relation of this shift? Well, we can just see that the relation is just very transparent uh, from an on-shell point of view because the spin is just generated by this minimal coupling, which exponentiates uh, when you take the classical solution. And that explains why this is complex shift. It also, this also explains many differences. So, for example, uh, you can do a phase rotation to the minimal coupling, so just take X into a complex phase rotation. And the result that you get is you generate what is known as a top knot space line. And this was uh, shown by a work that we did in collaboration with Donald O'Connell last year. And this also implies because if you, if you look at the, the, the electromagnetic couple version of this story, that that generates that goes from an electric couple objects to a dionic object. So that indicates that there's a relation between top knot and short shell uh, that is the gravitational version of the electromagnetic. And we found that indeed you can frame it like this, and what, what this rotation rotation corresponds to is the rotation between the super translation charge and the dual super uh, translation charge and B for EMS symmetry. So if, 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 if anyone is interested, we can discuss uh, after the talk. Good. So now we have the unification of all possible four-dimension black hole solutions just from this minimal problem. So uh, these are the, the known four dimension black hole solutions. So we have short shell, rise and horizon, curve, curve, human, top knot, and curve, top knot. And now uh, we can describe each of these solutions just through these minimal couplings. So, for example, you start with short shell, which is just the gravitational coupling. Rise and northern just means we have minimal coupling both in the gravitational sector and the photon sector. So, the first component is the photon sector, the, the second component is the gravitational sector. Kerr just means that the gravitational sector is minimally coupled with higher arbitrary spin. Kerr Newman is the same thing for both the gravitational and the, and the, the, the electric sector. Top knot is the phase rotation. Of course, you can put all of these modifications together to generate the Kerr top knot, which is uh, in a paper last month that we showed that this is the easy case. Good. So we've identified that this, uh, I hope I presented enough uh, uh, evidence to persuade you that this minimal coupling is describing these black hole solutions. So now we like this question what is actually the underlying principle uh, sitting behind this minimal coupling? Can we actually find a new principle here? Uh, to answer this, actually, uh, so we were motivated by various reasons to look at entanglement. Because, well, for one thing, S matrix is essentially by nature, it's a unitary map, right? You've got some in state, the S matrix maps each of out state. So, I mean, so by nature, it's a unitary map. So, if we consider a two to two scattering, so let's consider a two to two scattering. So, let's see, have A, B going to A, B. Now, of course, since we're, this is the two to two, we can ask about the entanglement for, uh, for the N state. And you do that by just compute the density matrix, you compute the reduced density matrix, and then you compute the binomial matrix, which gives you the entanglement. But since this is a two to two scattering, then we can talk about the, the difference between the entanglement entropy of the in state and the out state, right? 
So that means we can compute the out state entanglement and so we, uh, once again, compute the out state, reduce the uh, uh, density matrix and the reduced density matrix. And then you take the difference between the binomial entropy of the end state and the out state. And that gives you the information of how much entanglement is generated through this process. And naively, you would think that, hey, then it be shown, the, 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 the difference, should, first of all, it should always be positive. Second of all, it's not zero, right? Because I mean, just this diagram, these two objects are just coupled to each other through this interaction. Okay, so this is our expectation. So let's just go ahead and see if this is true. So now, the, of course, I need to tell you what Hilbert space I'm in. But because I'm talking about spinning objects, obviously the, the, the natural Hilbert space is the spin, uh, the spin space Hilbert space. So I'm going to take the, 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 the two particles uh, spin space Hilbert space. And my S matrix is going to map my in state to the out state. So I, I, so I can, it's very easy. I can just compute the out state and think of entropy, and, 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 which is the binomial entropy, and then see what's the difference. Uh, of course, this quantity, you might say that it might depend on what the, what the in state and think entropy is. You can also consider another uh, entanglement object, which is what is called entanglement power, which also measures the chain. So I won't go into detail here. The, the punch, the, the, the underlying statement is just you can use whichever you want. The, the, the result of what I'm going to tell you is exactly the same. So now let's go through this computation. So first we compute the first uh, single graviton tree level experience, and then we're going to do the Fourier transform to get the econol phase. And then we're going to do the econol approximation, which is the exponentiation of the econol phase, which in physics, or by in physics, what happens is that you're what, basically we're considering an infinite number of graviton exchange between these two sources in the econol, which means that only ladder diagram dominates. So this is near polar limit scattering with infinite number of graviton exchange. In other words, they're they're highly coupled with each other. So we do the computation. So this is uh, this is just show uh, what computation actually means. So we can basically, we compute the, first we start with the tree amplitude and then but we want to compute all these uh, spin multiples that couple with each other. The t's are, each t is essentially a spin. And the coefficient, for example, now uh, are functions. Uh, the important uh, thing here is that it's a function of the Wilson coefficient or uh, which for black holes, these seeds are just one. But in principle, this amplitude is a function of these Wilson coefficients. So you basically have a function of Wilson coefficients. You compute the econol phase, you exponentiate, and then we compute the change in the entanglement uh, entropy. So this is a plot, for example, that we just truncate to spin one. So this is the change in entanglement. And once again, the, 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 the horizontal axes are the Wilson coefficients. So notice this is, first of all, it's definitely positive, which of course we expect because then you have an interaction. So your entropy, your, your entropy must exchange, must um, uh, increase. So uh, it's interesting that you have, a, you, have a, you have basically a bottom here. And if you look carefully, you'll, you'll find that the bottom is exactly what the Wilson coefficients are one. And no, but really what's interesting is you notice what the entanglement entropy is, the change. The change is near zero. It's 10 to the minus 9 here. Uh, these are the, the, the kinematic uh, values where we, we've done this computation. Uh, so, okay, yeah, in the bottom. So, this is just truncating to spin one. Now we can include more and more spin if we do the analysis. By, by truncating to spin one, what I mean is I'm just considering the spin one over spin, which only has three components. So, I can go to spin two, spin three, and just Generate a larger my Hilbert space. So if I compute spin two, now you see that the, the, the change is very dramatic. So now this is at, up to spin three, uh, which means that we have uh, this is a seven by seven matrix uh, for a single particle. This is a change in entanglement entropy. And once again, it's always definitely positive as we expected. And, and then these are near maximal entanglement when we're, when we're, when we're away. From the central value, but in, when you immediately go to the central value here, it just drops dead. It just drops dead to zero, and the, the, the value here is basically 10 to the minus eight. Okay, so these are the two Wilson coefficients associated with the two objects. So you might you, you, you might ask why are these two values here? Two values are corresponds to, of course, since you have two objects, you can have one that is black hole and one that is not black. 
So these two valleys, each valley is going to refer to one of them as black hole, and when these two valleys intersect, uh, that means two of them are black holes. And uh, you, you're, you're not, uh, and basically, even within this valley, this the mutual uh, the double black hole point is the lowest. But this is good because I need to plot in two dimensions. So I, each time I do this plot, I need to choose two worlds in coordinates to do my plot. But this is, oops, sorry, so this is choosing another set of rules and coefficients to do my plot. And, and once again, you see that black hole value is, is here, and it's always near zero. So if you step back, you think this is really remarkable, right? Because what, 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 what is happening here? What is happening is that you have two spin states and they're going through with multiple graviton exchanges. And somehow whenever I, whenever I, when I put these two spin states to be black hole values, uh, they just, as if they never interact with them at all. It's just zero interaction, okay? And if you actually look at the, this is just an example of what the, this just at the linear order and spin, what the, what the uh, econom phase look like. You see that there's, there's a non I mean, there are non-trivial spin couplings here. There's S1 dot S2, there's various S dot S factors here. This is just uh, up the linear and spin. In higher order and spin, we have more and more these spin, spin coupling. So if you just look at this, if you just look at this, uh, this econo phase, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have expected that the resulting thing just have a zero uh, entanglement phase. And in fact, uh, if you actually go through all the computation, and so the, and we find that indeed uh, well, there is something special with the black hole. If you look at the econo phase, but if you take the relativistic limit, which means that you take the center of mass. Uh, momentum and m to, to be arbitrary to, to be in the infinity limit. The econo phase, after our onshore computation, it actually simplifies. And it simplifies. So, this is the diagonal part. So, the way that it simplifies is that the off diagonal spin flip part now goes to zero exactly when the, when, when the seeds are going to black, black hole values. So, that means that, that, so that explains why the entanglement entropy didn't change because. The spin spin flip flipping part of, uh, of, of, of the of the econo phase just vanishes, which means that whatever spin you come, whatever state spin state is that is that you come with, it's going to be exactly the spin the same spin state when you go out, because the spin flipping part is here. But this is only after you do the you do the computation, you get the final and final result, and you look at things on the chart. So it appears that the vanishing of the spin flip or the or, or the vanishing of the spin entanglement seems to be what characterizes what is special about this black hole band. So uh, of course I've just shown you the example of the spin three, but you can go to arbitrary higher spin. The analysis becomes more and more complicated, it's more space-based you want to do research about. But uh, in all the cases where we've searched, this is always the same result. You get the whenever you turn to black hole value. The spin entanglement goes to zero. So, uh, the, so the, 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 the conclusion is that at least at one PM order, since we just computed one graviton exchange at the in, inside the econo phase, then the, the black hole's moments are tuned such that the equal number one achieves vanishing spin rotation. So, of course, the question is what happens at 2 PM, which is the next order, which is something that we're computing now because there's something that is interesting at 2 PM. Which, when you consider, so this would be a 2 pm graph, which corresponds to one loop in quantum field theory. And importantly, when you want to compute this graph, but you you actually need something more than just the three point coupling here, which I circled in the, in the beginning of the talk. But you actually need a gravitational constant. And so, what actually is this amplitude? We actually don't know for arbitrary spin. And what we don't we don't know is that we it's not completely fixed. And interestingly, it's from a GR community, for the order that can resolve this issue has not been done yet. And actually, uh, there, there's some ambiguity associated to what needs to be done to compute this order. But what actually happens at 2 p.m. is an open question. So, might it be that we can just use the, the vanishing spin rotation, the vanishing spin and take over as the principle to guide us to fix? What exactly is the, the gravitational Compton amplitude that will be relevant to the two pm computation? So this will be an extremely interesting question that we're trying to answer uh, now. So uh, let me just conclude my talk. 
So we've seen that in, in terms of using this kind of on shell basis to look at gravitational interactions, the various properties of black hole solutions are actually cleanly captured. For one thing, just that single min minimal coupling, just write down one term, generates the complete black hole multiple expansion if you want to describe it in a traditional way, which means that you want to do this world line description. And more, more, more uh, importantly, the simplicity of this on shell basis uh, we really reflects some very a lot of hidden relations between the for the classical solution. But uh, there's some things that I haven't talked about, about which is the double copy, uh, the complex shift, which we talked about in the Janus Newman shift, the duality transformation, and the physical principle that appears a lot behind the spin minimal coupling appears to be this near zero spin entanglement. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, uh, there's lots of things to do uh, at this point. Of course, what is the story beyond the leading G? Since we're talking about uh, uh, multiple moments, so the natural thing for, for we all know that for electron is G minus two. So, for example, for these gravitational moments, is there anomalous gravitational moments? And uh, and for if there's anomalous gravitational moments, is there some theories in which the, the, the anomalous gravitational moments actually vanish? which means that there might be some hidden symmetry. These are all interesting questions. And certainly we can talk about charged black holes, soothing black holes, the difference between BPS and non-BPS black holes using this kind of uh, on-shell point of view, which will be interesting uh, questions to be answered in the future. So thank you very much. Any questions? So, so my question is about the variability of this modern genius shift. So we know that it was perfectly uh, to generate curved back and then back on the score very nice connection. But if we uh, consider Einstein to really couple with some nonlinear like nonlinear experimental fields, the solution, uh, I mean the rotating solution cannot be uh, I mean the rotating solution generated from this algorithm cannot be used with combined algorithm. And uh, I'm wondering if, if this kind of uh, functional uh, point of view can be, can be applied for us to, to know how this complex shift can be modified in order to generate uh, rotating solutions in that kind of theory. I'm not exactly sure uh, if they can tell you what kind of modification you need to do, but what I can say is that it can give you what actually is the answer should look like when you have these R2 questions. So let's say we, we're not talking about Einstein Dilbert, we're talking about Einstein Dilbert with some higher order correction, higher curvature correction. Then what will happen is that, in, in, for example, in these computations, when you're computing, uh, for example, the gravitational potential and, and, and various uh, physical observables, what will happen is that this cupid coupling here will now receive a modification uh, by the arc, by the higher curvature correction. And so, in other words, so that means that. The, the relationship, I would say that the relationship between a spinning and a non spinning uh, uh, solution would be that once again, I still do this minimal coupling with this higher, uh, this higher spin minimal coupling. But, in, but instead of the usual computation, the three point uh, pure gravitational sector uh, computation here, I would just modify it by RQ. And then I would get an answer of the prediction of what this object should, or what the variable of this object should be. In terms of going back and asking uh, uh, how is it related to just the complex shift, uh, that probably you need to do more analysis. But in terms of what to do, it's very clear what to do. Thank you. So, uh, have you applied this to different states and dynamics? Scaling? Yeah, that's that. And if so, what about two plus one dynamics? Because in, in two plus one, there is no Newtonian limit for GR. So what is method will you do? Good. Uh, so okay. So there's there's really two questions here. So, okay. So first of all, let's go first going up. So going to higher dimensions. So of course, this is strictly in four dimensions because of the analysis that you four dimensions go to. So it is interesting that in higher dimensions we know that there's black hole. So spherical symmetric solutions are no longer unique. So, so now you have, for example, higher dimension. You have Saturn. You have ring solutions. And indeed, if you go to higher dimension, what happens is this, uh, I mean, this X thing that, that I defined previously uh, here, which is defined kinematically, which you, you'll probably notice that it's really anchoring what are these black hole couplings. Now it's no longer a scalar, it becomes a, a for example, a five dimension, it 
become the two by two uh, vector. So it's no longer unique. And it probably also reflects the fact that the, the, that the black hole solutions are no longer unique uh, in higher dimension there. Uh, I know that there's some people who are working on these higher dimension generalization. And uh, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, I think at least rudimentary is showing that there is a match between the non uniqueness of minimal coupling in higher dimensions and the non uniqueness of the black hole solutions. Going down in one dimension lower, since we're talking about on shell scanners, so the statement about non Newtonian dynamics goes back to the statement about. Uh, uh, about that in three dimensions, uh, the onshore degrees of freedom of, of gravity is zero. There's no onshore degree of freedom. So, of course, then we, there's no connection between these. There's no S matrix in the elements to start with. On the other hand, there is three. If you just directly take four dimensions and compact it to three dimensions, that theory will still be a gravitational theory. It's just that it's now you have, you now you have extra mass that's scalar that is sourcing something that looks like that. And for that, in principle, you can do the same analysis. But of course, for pure gravity, there's nothing you can do because there's just no the Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Final question. Oh, I have a, a few questions. So, this is Catherine. You started handling uh, um, two platform versions. I'm not sure the first question was uh, taken on uh, the of observation. So, can you see that? So, so the relation between the, the, the black hole, so this is exactly related to the black hole merger, but as I mentioned in the beginning, so in the black hole merger uh, process, you basically go through three stages, the in spiral stage, which is spiraling with both the spiraling, and then the merger stage and the recap stage. So there's various, there's different ways of treating. Uh, so usually the, the merger stage, of course, is strong gravity with the huge miracle. In principle, you can treat the inspire phase by numerically, but it's it's it's, it's uh, very very uh, resource consuming because there's more there's high number of revolutions, so you don't want to really just waste your compute on computing these high number of revolutions. So usually, what you do here is to treat it analytically, and to treat it analytically, you will need to solve the equation of motions, which means that you need a gravitational potential between these objects. And so this scattering process, the scattering approach is basically giving you uh, the, the, this, uh, this uh, gravitational potential between these two objects. So that's the relation between the, the, the black hole. Yeah. So now you are thinking that the black holes are coming to the screen. So you think of the screens or the more science time or the Fermi Yeah, so where are the So yeah, so, so, so just, let me just be very precise. So what I mean here, but of course for particles, we know there's a difference between the bigger and that and the big space. But really, because in the end, we're taking the classical spin, sorry, which means that we're basically, what we're basically doing is we take this uh, this form, this function as a function of s, and then we just analytically take s to infinity with h bar going to zero, s times h bar fixed. So it's really just taking this. And of course, when you look at analytic in s, then you'll notice when s is half integer, the function that we have actually has an anti-symmetric property. And when s is integer, it doesn't have the anti-symmetric property. Which reflects the spin statistic, but we're just taking s to infinity and then analytically, and and so this this goes away. So we're really talking about, when we're matching the black hole, we're talking about classical spin. So the, so s is not quantized thing; it's just s is basically an infinite limit. But because your h bar is going to zero, because it's going to the classical limit, so s times h bar is still a fixed value. Yeah, then the black holes are very heavy. So what type of energy are talking about? Uh, yeah, once again, whether the classical uh, uh, thing always work, or maybe some uh, maybe work. Right, it doesn't certainly doesn't work in the in the merger phase, right? It certainly doesn't work. So really, what we're doing is we're doing the, the, the long distance dynamics, which in which the reason why we, I, I keep talking about econol phase, econol limit, and various of this, these are really long distance dynamics. So we're using this to describe when the black holes are far away, which is actually why it's interesting because you can actually tell whether or not it's black hole even when it's far away. That's pretty density far without ever talking about the appearance of the event horizon or anything. You can already know that it's a black hole. Okay. So uh, because of time, I think we have to finish this session and lunch. Thank you very much, Osan. Thanks, Frank, for everything again. Thank you. Thank you.
in this session. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Daniel Tom. Okay. The title of his talk is uh, The Cosmological History. Okay. So, uh, Daniel, please start. Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak at this meeting. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, although I'm currently in Taipei, but unfortunately I'm teaching right after this talk. So I have a teaching conflict that I unfortunately couldn't, couldn't escape. Um, however, I believe in two weeks I'm going to come to N NCTS for a seminar. So I hope to meet uh, a lot of you in person then. Um, oh yeah, let me share my screen. <clears throat> 